Warning. The following episode contains subject matter and scenes that some viewers may find upsetting, disturbing, or unnerving. Please note, viewer discretion is advised at all times. Sit back and enjoy. When the usually reliable John Price hadn't turned up for work on the morning of March 1st, 2000, a colleague went to see if he was all right. After noticing blood spatter and smears all over the front door, the workmate frantically called for the police. No amount of training or experience could prepare police for the downright vision of hell they were about to encounter at John Price's home in the peaceful little Hunter Valley hamlet of Aberdeen. They made their way through the house, careful to avoid placing their feet in the seemingly endless puddles of blood. On the kitchen stove, they found a human head sitting in a pot amidst an array of boiled veggies. A sickening stew. Plated on the kitchen table were what appeared to be steaks, presented with vegetables. Unfortunately, the steaks were cut from the very same body on which the head once sat. In the lounge was that body, sliced and skinned from every imaginable angle by someone with expertise. The ferocity of the attack made it difficult to count the number of wounds. The blood loss was massive. Vitals like the lungs, liver, kidneys and aorta were all savage. It was a scene so dark, so depraved and yet so evil that surely nobody in their right mind could possibly have conducted it. Yet, there was more of the house to explore. Hello and welcome back to another I Could Murder, a podcast episode number eight. I'm Tom Norris and I'm joined by my little friend, Benjamin Carter. Finally, Tom, we're in Australia. We're in Boston Sound, but I know what you're trying to get at, yeah. We're in the great outback, in between the bush. Yep, we're in the bush. You need to grow up and grow up quickly. Yes, today's case is going to take us all the way across the world to Australia. But before we start, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, give us a like if you enjoy the episode, and why not turn the notification bell on? Yes, and as always, our socials are at Could Murder a Pod. That's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, and you can also hit us up for some additional bonus exclusive content on patreon.com. Why not consider that? Yes, there's over 20 unseen episodes over there with a Q&A and also just, yeah, Minnesota's of cases that we've covered. And also we've got a merch stall, we've got mugs, we've got hats, we've got a tote bag, we've got a bundle deal. So if you want to support the pod, why not head over there and have a little purchase? Thank you so much. And any support is, is massively appreciated. So Ben, today's case, did you hear, did you know much about it before researching? I knew very little. I knew that uh, it was a case that you were quite keen on, um, but Apart from some brief insights you've given me, I really don't know that much, or didn't. Maybe still don't. Who knows? Let's find out. So today's case is Catherine Knight, the abattoir murderer of Aberdeen. So what was it about her case, Tom? And it is a fascinating one, but what was it that, that kind of prompted you to want to cover this case? She looks like you'd walk past her in the street and she looks a very normal person. Um, and the crimes she committed are just so grotesque um i mean she basically she's the first woman in australia to be sentenced to life in prison so i think that goes to kind of hint that her the the, the case is very very dark um yeah I, I only heard little snippets before about her and i found it just a ghoulish kind of story um a lot of times the cases we cover tends to be numerous like a mass murder or, or, or a serial killer um and this is this is just the one murder but her story where she got from being yeah. just Catherine Knight <clears throat> to where she is now, it's quite a long story. It's quite a long story and there's lots of twists and turns. And there's lots of times when you think why she wasn't uh, prevented from yes. committing this crime. So Catherine Mary Knight was born on the 24th of October in 1955 in Tenterfield, which is in New South Wales, Australia. So Catherine uh, was born into a fairly dysfunctional family environment. So from the off, her mother, Barbara, um, had had an affair on her partner, Jack, at the time with an individual called Ken Knight. And Ken was a co-worker of Jack. Shortly after the affair began, uh, Barbara fell pregnant. And as a result, Catherine was born. 
So Catherine was a twin. So her and her sister Joy were born from, uh, yeah, from from, a, from an affair, so to speak. But the family in general is is, is very dysfunctional. Uh, the, there was a lot of abuse and violence within the household. Her father was an alcoholic who who violently raped her mother up to 10 times a day as an intimidation tactic. And Catherine herself also claimed that she had been sexually abused, but it wasn't from her father. But growing up in that household, you know, it's, it, like a lot of these cases, is a place where you know you wouldn't wish upon your worst enemies growing up in there and just the way the way everyone was behaving a lot of drinking a lot of violence so by the age of three or four Catherine had had experienced some horrible things seeing her mother being raped and like the violence within her household um and this is the time it was a real important time for, for a child you know to develop like you're learning empathy you're learning how people behave you're learning how family dynamics work and you know, a clear coping mechanism for that is dis disassociation um just to try and like distance yourself from it and it's been speculated later on, this is a period in time that really shifted Catherine's way of thinking. Yeah, such important years of any child's life. And, and she is immediately in an environment where there's lots of hostility, lots of anger, lots of aggression. But they're also in a fairly kind of small, rural, conservative town. And word travels very fast about this affair. And now these uh, babies brought into the world, which uh, as a result means that um, both uh, Barbara and Ken... Um, decide to leave the local area and relocate. It's important to note before this affair properly took place, Barbara had already had four children with Jack prior to this affair, but she would then go on to have an additional four children with Ken. So altogether there's eight children in this family dynamic. Um, Jack would pass away when Catherine was very, very young. So basically the affair happening caused a major scandal uh, in, the, in the town, which forced them to relocate and move to Marie. Um, none of her four sons went with her. The two older boys continued to reside with their father, while the two younger sons were sent to be raised by an aunt in Sydney. So Catherine growing up wasn't too close to her family members except for a twin and her uncle Oscar Knight, who was a champion horseman. Ooh. Her uncle Oscar committed suicide and Catherine claims that the oh. go his ghost visits her. Oh, you went on a little I journey. I went on a journey there, you yeah, did. around the racetrack. <laughs> So another important uh, piece to note, uh, Tom mentioned that um, Ken would be very uh, sexually aggressive to Barbara. And in some cases, Kathy would witness uh, the rapes of her, of her mother. So Barbara would talk to her daughters about sex. You know, obviously the, the, the daughters, they witnessed the rape in the household. And also she, she'd go on to say why she despised men. And once Catherine, because she felt she had the relationship with her mum, she could speak to her. She spoke. She asked her because um, one of her boyfriends at the time wanted her to, ha to to perform a sexual act, which she felt uncomfortable with. And her mum just said to put up with it and stop complaining. Yeah, it was uh, definitely not a lot of support in that household. In fact, it would go as far as Catherine later claiming that she was frequently sexually assaulted by several different members of her family all the way through to the age of eleven. Though she would state it was not by her father. Yeah, so she's so as we said, like throughout this, she's grown up. She's she's disassociated a lot of things, and uh, she's also learnt, the way she's learned about sex is people just get it that they it's it's not worth anything, you know. It's it's not an intimate thing. No, it's just it's just a kind of a uh, primal urge rather than anything anything else. Yeah, and I mean a, a lot of information as we go through the uh, the the life of of Catherine. Um, there is some conjecture there because she she's been evaluated by different psychiatrists, and there's a lot of information Catherine will sometimes claim to have given that doesn't completely or cannot completely be evidenced. However, this in all likelihood is something that's you know heavily influenced her. So there's not a lot of reason for her to lie about something like this. So at school she was a loner, but she was also a bully in school. She had a very short fuse, and the the most minor things would get you know become very aggressive, like and get very upset. However, a lot of the teachers said she could be a very pleasant girl. So she was either very pleasant or she was very angry. There wasn't really a middle ground there. A classmate recalled when the twins argued about whose turn it was to use a bike. They didn't pinch or pull hair. They beat the living crap out of each other. So they've, you know, the household that so used to kind of violence. And I think it was a case of just, again, there was no middle ground with, with Kathy and I, as, we, as we'll go on to say that it's, it, things escalate very quickly. Um, she, she didn't really enjoy school. She wasn't academic. She left school at 15 and never learned to read or write. She also assaulted at least one boy uh, at the school with a weapon and was once also injured by a teacher who was subsequently found to have acted in self-defense, which... Uh is is kind of a crazy thing to imagine if a, a teacher is defending themselves from this, you know, 14, 15 year old girl at the time. 
So upon leaving school at the age of 15, without having learned to read or write, she would gain employment as a cutter in a clothing factory. And 12 months later, she would change her job to work at the local abattoir. So uh, the local abattoir was where a lot of her family had worked. Her dad worked there. Her brothers had worked there. It, it was kind of... It was within the family and she very much wanted to kind of follow that as a, as a job. And she's very excited to go in there. For people that don't know what an abattoir is, Ben, do you want to... Uh, it was essentially a slaughterhouse. She was quickly promoted to the position of being a boner. boner and was given her own set of knives. And these knives were kept above her bed in every home she lived in until arrest. So, yeah, she absolutely loved working there. She liked intimidating people, you know, having the knives. She, the way she she behaved when she was there, she was she apparently was great with a knife and she was very good at her job, but she would enjoy killing the animals. She'd enjoy cutting them. Um, she'd quite often like nick an artery on purpose just to see the blood pour. Um, she, and she would like the fact that her doing these kind of things in front of, of the co-workers, they would be a bit intimidated, a bit creeped mm. out by her. She, she loved that power. And she was definitely getting something from from killing the animals. Um, it, it kind of satisfied this this anger she had and this like kind yeah. of bloodlust she had. And she she would enjoy the fear in the eyes of the animals, knowing they're going to be killed by her. It was it was a very unhealthy, but at the same time, is weirdly in that line of work, you're there to do that job. And she was doing it, and she had no kind of qualms with it. And she she was just she said on. to be very good at it as well. But yeah. I mean, one of the reasons she um, hung the the knives I mean she took the knives home with her first of all so a few questions there but secondly the, one of the reasons why she hung them above her bed was because they would always be handy if I needed them yeah interesting it's like a uh, like a kind of morbid dream catcher so yeah growing up she um, she did have boyfriends she was she was known she was known as being very charming at times um, and you know very likable if she had a few drinks or if, some, if something got wound up the wrong way it, she would be very angry and very vicious and it wasn't the case of a little bicker, things would usually tend to get violent quite quickly. Yeah, and as Tom mentioned, she's got, you know, a face very much of someone that you just cross on the street. I think at one stage or another, everyone's seen a, a, a Catherine Knight walk down the street, but, well, thank God, not the real Catherine Knight, but, yeah, she's got very, she looks very innocent. So typically we we do a timeline. However, I think the four big parts of, of this particular case are four men that would uh, come into Catherine's uh, life at various points in time. And in my opinion, I've said three of the four were quite lucky, but I mean, none of them were really too lucky in the end. But many of those who knew her, even her ex-husbands and boyfriends, said she was generous and good fun and would be the first one to lend a helping hand if anyone needed. But we're going to go into right now, what, what would come with being a partner of Catherine Knight? Hmm. So the first individual that came into Catherine's life was Mr. David Kellett. Now, Knight first met uh, David, uh, who was a co-worker at the time, actually, and a very hard-drinking co-worker at that. And she met him in 1973. Um, Kellett had previously worked for um, the railways, um, and his best friend was actually killed in front of him during a shunting accident. Yeah, they, they think that maybe his drinking kind of came along hand in hand with the fact he witnessed that. And he later was present when a train hit a school bus in Kempsey, killing six children in 1968. He helped rescue the injured and remove the bodies. So they, people think that his, his heavy drinking may have actually been due to that. So David Keller, um, he was he was affectionately known as Shorty because he was quite a short gentleman as well. He, lo he loved the drink. He worked hard. He met Catherine and I, and as I said, like when people meet her for the first time, she seems very charming um, and she's quite a bit taller than him as well. So they got together and they, very quickly they, they got very attached to one another. Um, you know, apparently they couldn't keep their hands off one another when they were on nights out. And they married in 1974 at her request with the couple arriving at the service on her motorcycle with a very intoxicated Kellett on the back which is quite the, quite the image. So Knight's mother, Barbara, gave Kellett some advice at the wedding. So this, this is Knight's mother to Kellett. She said, the old girl said to me to watch out. You better watch this one or she'll fucking kill you. Stir her up the wrong way or do the wrong thing and you're fucked. Don't ever think of playing up on her. She'll fucking kill you. And that was her mother talking. She told me she's got something loose. She's got a screw loose somewhere. So Barbara not thinking a great deal of her daughter, Catherine, there. No, Barbara doesn't seem like the... Um nicest mother-in-law to have um, married into them. Yes, and in the wedding night, um, Knight choked Kellett in his sleep after only having intercourse with her two times. After being told by her mother on her wedding night, she had sex five times, so Knight got very violent thinking that Kellett hadn't performed as well as he should have done. So in May 1976, shortly after the birth of their first child, Melissa Ann, Kellett left Catherine for another woman and moved to Queensland, apparently unable to cope with Knight's possessive violent behaviour. 
So this is a big kind of turning point. Obviously, like we said, Knight can get very drunk and get very kind of, you know, on the wedding night, she strangled him. So it just goes to show the kind of relationship they had. So in, respo- so in response to this, the next day, Catherine was seen pushing her baby pram down the street, very violently kind of rocking the pram side to side. So she's walking down the street. And like, you know, if you saw any person acting like that, you'd be very alarmed. She was admitted to St. Elmo's Hospital in Tamworth, where she was diagnosed with postnatal depression and spent several weeks there recovering. So you thought she's now been, obviously it's been realized and noticed the way she's behaving, she's behaving very erratically. And you think, okay, they've diagnosed her with postnatal depression. You'd hope she'd get the aftercare and they'd keep an eye on her and make sure that everything was all right. But after being re- released, Knight placed a two-month-old Melissa on a railway line shortly before a train was due. A man known in the district as Old Ted, who was foraging near the railway line, found and rescued Melissa by all accounts only minutes before the train passed. That's um, that's incredible. Yeah, so it, it, she's doing that and it's very much in a way to spike Kellett. Uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, she's trying to in danger his daughter um she then stole an axe went into town and threatened to kill several people after being admitted to St Elmo's apparently she recovered and signed herself out the following day so that's that's the fir- that's like the big red flag for me mm. obviously the red flag is shaking your kid around and then it would mean to be fair a red flag would be strangling your partner on your wedding night but yeah. then shaking your ba- baby around putting them on the tracks the fact you're able to you know yourself um, sign yourself out the next day. Yeah, well, she's also gone running through the town centre, wielding an axe, saying she's going to kill everyone. Um, so that's already about five few questions. questions there. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, so it doesn't seem like she <laughs> wasn't followed up as much as you would, you know, imagine. This is all in a short period of time as well. A few days later, Knight took a family hostage and demanded that they take her to Queensland so she could find and kill Kellett's mum. Because that's the way, you know, she she was like, okay, well, if, if endangering is, I mean, obviously it's back in the day. That, and obviously this is like a long time ago, so it wasn't a case of people were filming her on Instagram so Kellett could see. But she thought, how can I do something that's going to affect Kellett and he's going to react? So she thought, I'll go find the mum so he could kill her. So the family convinced Catherine to go to a service station and to let their boy go because he had asthma, which I thought was quite, must be good work from them. So their boy was in the car, they were driving. Let's can we go to the service station and let her boy off because he has asthma. She's like, okay, that's fair enough. I'll let him go. The boy alerted the police. Good work, the boy. She was disarmed when the police attacked her with brooms and was admitted to the Morissette Psychiatric Hospital. Knight told the nurses she had intended to kill the mechanic at the service station because he had helped repair Kellett's car, which had allowed him to leave. So, yeah, she's got, very much got her eyes and, you know, her focus set on Kellett and she's she's very, very angry and and wanting to do anything just to to harm him. Um, the kind of unbelievable part of it is when police informed Kelly of the incident, he left his girl. He was having problems with her anyway, but he left his girlfriend and moved to Aberdeen with his mother to support Knight. Which I that's, that's another part of it where you kind of like that is bizarre. On the 9th of August, nineteen seventy six, Knight was released and uh, placed into the care of her mother in law, and along with Kelly, they moved to Ipswich, which was a, which is a suburb of Brisbane, um, where she obtained a job at the Dinmore Meatworks. Uh, so back into a you know a role she has massive passion for. They then had another daughter, Natasha Marie. So with um, Kelly and Catherine having another, another daughter, Kelly's sister Sandy, um, who said that Catherine was very likable, very charming, and she got on with her quite well. She heard a loud cry coming from the bathroom one night, and she went, when she went to see what was happening, she found Catherine holding the baby under the hot tap, hot scalding tap. So the baby was obviously crying in immense pain. When she told David, David said, don't ask her about it tonight as she will kill you and probably me too. Just again shows that, yeah, he David knew she was very, very dangerous. So she placed one child on the train tracks and potentially the same or another child under hot scalding water. Yeah. And they're still letting her, you know, move about freely. They're not reporting her to the police. And they're just saying, you know, don't bother her tonight. Let's talk about it another day when she's calmed down. So essentially, if you get on the wrong side of Catherine Knight, you are done for. Yeah, so um, being on the wrong side could be something as simple as coming home late from a darts tournament, which Kayla did one night. and We've all been there. And she hit him on the back of the skull with a frying pan, which fractured his skull. So as well as striking him on the back of the head with a frying pan, she also burned all of his clothes and shoes. He was able to escape before passing out in a a neighbor's house. Um, police wanted to charge Knight. However, um, she changed her behaviour 
and Kellett talked the police down. A lot of times she would claim that the, her partner was attacking her and it was the other way around. And I think sometimes with this, um, a lot of the men, you know, especially back in, back in that day, domestic abuse being the woman harming, harming the man, it would be kind of laughable in inverted comments and they wouldn't want to be known as the guy being beaten around by their, their partner. I also think she's probably got Kellett to a point where Keller, even if he hadn't initiated anything or re- responded to anything, if she's saying, you hit me, to the police, he'd go along with it. It might be an easier life. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So David caught Knight in bed on one night with another man, but she convinced David to take her back. And in 1984, Knight would actually end up leaving Kellett, and she moved first to her parents' house back in Aberdeen, but then to a rented house in nearby Muswell Brook. So after she left Kellett, Knight moved on to David Saunders. Knight soon started following her same kind of pattern of behaviour, getting very jealous uh, regarding regarding not knowing what he was doing and where she was going and she would often throw him out. She once smashed him in the face with an iron when he was late from home and it wasn't a case of just the iron was sitting there. She had been using it and apparently it was steaming hot and there's marks in his face from the, the holes of the iron there left left for weeks. In May 1987, um, Catherine Knight would go on to cut the throat of um, David Saunders two-month-old dingo pup and she did this for no other reason than just to prove never to be on the wrong side of her she then would go on to knock him out with a frying pan that's yeah yeah so you you just don't want to get on the wrong side well is there a right side of this woman i know she's got that very um uh likable charming side to her but that seems few and far between at the moment like like a lot of people have said like people say she's very charming um and she is and like the things that kind of it seems to be a lot of her anger seems to be taken out on her partner, yeah. rather than just the general general public. Um, you know, she should get on with the neighbours, should get on with you know people she worked with, but it just seemed to be she would have a very short fuse when it came to someone she was uh, involved in. Yeah, because even when she met met uh, Saunders and then they ended up kind of getting their own place together, he kept hold of the lease on his second apartment, and she was livid. Of any you know any time he'd go over there or stay in there, even if it was closer to work. And she would punish him for for having a second apartment because she didn't trust him. Yeah, yeah. She um she she turned up to her twin Joy's house with a shotgun, saying that she had killed David. She hadn't, but she did it because she basically people kind of theorize why she'd done this and what this behavior kind of demonstrates. But she, like you said before, with the abattoir, she enjoyed seeing the fear in people's eyes. She enjoyed mm-hmm. shocking them, and she did this. People think to kind of help her plan the day when she finally does go on and kill someone. Um, kind of what's the kind of way to go with it which is highly peculiar behavior um but yeah it's yeah this it's, it's Catherine Knightley weird and a lot of things are peculiar at the moment um Knight decorated the house that Sanders bought in a very peculiar way yes do you want to explain Ben yeah so she um she actually got some uh workers compensation come through after the birth of their second daughter and uh, they would use the money to decorate the house throughout with animal skins, animal skulls, horns, rusty animal traps, leather jackets, old boots, machetes, rakes, and pitchforks. There was no space at all left uncovered, um, and, and that was including the roof. So all the walls, all the ceilings, all the floors covered. Yeah, and she apparently wished she would have lots and lots of gruesome horror movies there. She very much enjoyed watching kind of anything gruesome. Like we said, the abattoir, that, that was probably the place where she was happiest. She, you know, just she was just fascinated by horror, murder. It's just very grimy kind of, a very grimy look on life. Yeah, there was, no, there was very little time for peace and kind of tranquility when it comes to Catherine Knight. So another night with Saunders and another argument would result in him being stabbed with a pair of scissors. He moved back to Scone. When he later returned home, he found that she had cut up all of his clothes. So as a result of this attack, um, Saunders would take a long service leave and he actually ended up going into hiding from Knight. Um, Knight tried to find him, but no one, uh, including his work colleagues and family, admitted to knowing his whereabouts. So he truly went into hiding from this woman. Um, Several months later, Saunders returned to see his daughter and found that Knight had gone to the police and unjustly told them she was afraid of him. This year she got a restraining order out on him, Yeah, which is uh, ironic, preventing him from seeing their daughter. So again, to try and punish perhaps or control. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. She seems to be able to flip the the victim card and the, uh, you know, she fills them with fear, but then she's able to play the card where she's scared of them and she keeps swipping and, and swapping with that. Um, so after Saunders, and she doesn't have any trouble finding 
her new partner, it seems. She goes, mm. it's very quick. As we said, she's, she seems to be very charming. Uh, Knight had one more relationship before her final relationship with a man named John Chillingworth, with whom she had a son named Eric. Yeah, with, with Chillingworth, um, I saw a few arguments and whatnot, but it, Chillingworth is the only ex-partner who uh, still looks at her in a, in a kind of lovingly, loving way um, because she would go on to leave him um, and she would leave him for John Price or AKA Pricey to his pals. And this is where things get even uglier. Yeah. So despite uh, that relationship with Chillingworth breaking down, um, it was actually due to Knight having an affair with John Price um, who was said to be a handsome local man. So in 1995, uh, Catherine moved into John Price's house. Now, John was very aware of Catherine's reputation of being a violent and aggressive and uh, kind of uncontro- no, unpredictable uh, person. But despite that, you know, he was happy, uh, you know, saw the loving side of her, was kind of spellbound by her again. And um, yeah, they moved in together. Yeah, so... Price was known by the locals. He was a very heavy drinker, but he he was a very reliable, hardworking man. He worked at the local mines, and even if he had a big, heavy night's drink in the night before, which most that was most nights, he'd be the first one on the site. He wouldn't be complaining. He'd be there to, you know, to the very end. So he was known, you know, just being like the way they described it in the documentaries I watched. Just your typical kind of Aussie guy yeah. liked his drink, liked his banter, and also he was very, very hardworking. Um, his his nickname for for Catherine Knight was the Speckled Hen. There you go. So yeah, like I like Ben said, although they would have very horrible screaming matches, Pricey thought of his life as a bed of roses. Yeah, and he was, uh, as Tom said, you know, everyone who knew him liked him. Um, he was said to be a terrific bloke. So Price also had children of his own. He had three children from a previous marriage. So the relationship was fairly smooth sailing for the first couple of years. However, in 1998, uh, they began to fight over Price's refusal to marry her. Yes. I don't know what it is. Catherine seems to have a very kind of set mind of what it needs to, how her life needs to be. And it seems to be to have kids and to be married. It seems to be that kind of picture perfect lifestyle that she seems to have very much fixated in her head, even though it seems to be her, the one that is completely goes against it once it's happened. I mean, when you look at it with Kellett, she had two children with him, married, but that was enough. Then she left him. I know, obviously, they had a lot of kind of bumps in the road as well, but it was very peculiar. But yeah, um, Price's daughters, uh, they, they said that um, Catherine was very charming and they yeah. liked to go on with her. Um, but yeah, this this really did kind of, this was the kind of turning point. Um, Price essentially said that he, uh, he, he, was, he just wanted the sex. He didn't want the kind of, he didn't want marriage. Yeah. I mean, they, they were still kind of living together, like kind of off and on, but he made it clear that's all that's you know he didn't want anything other than that um so night no, was kind of yeah that really rubbed right the wrong way yeah the fact that she wasn't wanted i mean the whereas the rest of the 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 gentlemen previous had all been kind of you know uh almost obsessed with yeah, her sort of yeah yeah um price was definitely you know a lot more casual and and perhaps the one that she had the most feelings for as well so it's kind of a double Double whammy. Her, yeah. her immediate kind of retaliation to that, she told one of his daughters that she wasn't his daughter, <sighs> which she's so manipulative and she thinks, where, how can I, you know, hurt this person? So she she did that. Um, she would go through go through all this stuff, and she found out in his will, he was leaving his money to his daughters and his ex wife, which is a completely. That's not always that's normal. That's normal, and you think, okay, that's just a father wanted to look after his family. Um, but she demanded he give her 10 grand and she would leave, but he didn't, which again, that's fair enough. And the way she retaliated here was she ended up filming some um, equipment he had around his house because he had taken it from work and she went on to show the police and his employers. Yeah. And this would end up with him getting laid off. He had been working there for 17 years and this was a well-paid job, but he was really well known at for being a work hard, a hard worker and he got laid off because of Catherine Knight's behaviour. Yeah, and this is an interesting film because some of the uh, the items that she taped uh, to evidence that he'd stolen were out-of-date medical kits that he had scavenged from the company's rubbish tip. So it was stuff that they were chucking away anyway. Like a womble. Like a womble. That very same day, Price uh, obviously was laid off. He kicked her out and she returned to her own home while news of what she had done spread throughout the town. So again, it's a very small-knit community. I mean, Catherine, by this point, is very well known for her past already. Yeah, you'd cross the street if you saw her coming. Oh, absolutely. No, not, and not just because she's trying to hit you with a pram. 
Um, she another another little thing, just a kind of an insight in, in terms of her behaviour. Was Price's daughter said when they were driving, she'd be driving around with her and with them in the car. She would swerve to hit dogs. I don't. I don't like her, Tom. No, she's a very unlikable woman. So a few months later, Price, despite everything that's happened here, would rekindle the relationship with Knight, which again seems to be a running theme with guys that that kind of break up with her. They they always seem to to come crawling back. Yeah, I think it's it's, it's very tricky. I mean, Price, you know, he, he wasn't. He was still you know, in his forties. Yeah. Um, so again, it might be that he seemed to be just that he wanted an easy life. He's you know, his kind of his apparently his mantra to his his girls would just be happy, and uh, maybe he looked at Catherine and he felt sorry for, her and he he kind of felt like you know she's she's um, had a hard time. She's had a hard life. I've had a, I've had a difficult moments myself. Maybe we can make each other happy one last time. In an abusive relationship, is you know it's very often you know there's certain patterns of behaviour where you know. I've changed. I, I love you, and the kind of reward from that feeling that it can be very hard to kind of um, to to uh, pull away from that. Yeah, there's a, there's that very famous photo uh, that of of Price and Knight that I always kind of summarizes this relationship quite well. And she looks that it's, it's at night. It looks like it's some sort of party. She's got a cigarette in her hand, very happy. Um, he is looking straight at the camera with a beer in his hand, and he couldn't look more not wanting to be there. Yeah. Um, it's actually quite chilling in hindsight. Yes. But he um, rekindled the relationship on the basis that they do not live together or she does not come around his house at all. So again, he's kind of getting uh, to go back to... That would have been a hard sell. Yeah. We can be together, but can we just not be together? Yeah. I like you, but I can't stand you. I like you, yeah, but... Yeah, I like you, but I wouldn't do a podcast with you. It's like, I don't know if she... I don't know if she meant that. So obviously, like, you know, we've kind of said and like, I'm sure you, the audience would agree after all these red flags, this kind of behavior, what price, ha you know, price taking her back is a very, you you just can tell it's a, it's a recipe for disaster, essentially. You may have to pay a price. So his friends, you know, his, his long time drinking buddies, you know, who go out drinking with them a lot, they basically kind of shunned him after taking her back just because they knew how horrible she was. I mean, I think everyone's had that situation where, you know, someone's been with a partner and you don't agree with it, it kind of muddies the waters. And like, yeah, he took her back and they were like, if you're, you know, you've, choos you've chosen her kind of over us. So he was very isolated when he took her back as well, which is, which is the sad part. They're just all on that bar stool and they just 180 degree. We move to February 29th, 2000. On his way home from work, Price stopped at Scone Magistrates Court, took out an apprehended violence order against Knight, um, which would enable um, enable him to keep Knight away from him and his children. Um, he told his co-workers that if he did not come uh, to work the following morning, that more than likely Knight had murdered him. They all begged and pleaded for him not to go home, but he was afraid that if he did not go home, Knight would murder his children. Yeah, he also said to his neighbours, you know, because like we said, like Price is kind of work ethic. He, he was known for it. He was always a hard worker. He never really had a sick day. Um, he even said to his neighbours, if you wake up in the morning and you're getting up and going to work and my car still in the driveway, something terrible has happened. Um, yeah, and yeah, it, it, it's just, he knows something bad's going to happen. And that's the scary thing here. So everything, something's have escalated. Catherine's been acting even kind of more erratic than usual. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. It's prices. Prices have kind of felt that. So on this day, Catherine would buy some black lingerie, and she made a video which she, she kind of viewed as her will and testament. She's kind of listing things she had and who she would like. You know, one day I'd like you know this to be yours and such and such. It wasn't. She didn't explicitly say this is her will and testament, but it's kind of looking back on it with all this other information we have. You kind of think she's doing it as a kind of, yeah, a bespoke kind of will. Later that night, um, you know, every, he, he'd returned home. Everything was as normal. They had dinner. They went to bed. Knight and Price uh, slept in separate rooms and Knight prompted Price in the middle of the night in her new black lingerie and the pair had sex. She then allowed him to fall back to sleep before she came back into the room and stabbed him 37 times. She's gone from hitting other partners on the head with frying pans, fracturing the skull. She's gone to putting a, a baby on a train track. She stabbed someone before with a pair of scissors. So you could see a gradual escalation here in terms of like the violence. Like I know some of the crimes we've covered before, like Speck, it kind of seemed to go from, you know, 
zero to a hundred, but this there has been a clear escalation. Mm-hmm. But uh, I mean, this in itself as a sentence is a, is a sounds like a, an absurd thing to say. But stabbing Price thirty seven times is light compared to what she goes on to do. If she was just stabbing to kill, and she's worked in an abattoir, she knows what she's doing. Yeah. She, and she she's doing this out of a, a pure fit of rage. Yeah, she's seen red, and she's just going to you know absolutely lost in doing this. Um, and that's a horrible thing. With the price, that actually, you know, that they actively been looking to try and find ways to prevent you know his relationship with Catherine. Essentially, the pair had just had sex as well, so she's kind of twinning that uh, act of sex with violence again, which is kind of from her upbringing. Something that was like a praying to... mantis. Yes, she would go on to decapitate Price and cooked parts of his body, serving up the meat with baked potato, pumpkin, beetroot, cabbage, yellow squash, and gravy in two settings at the dinner table, along with notes beside each plate, each having the name of Price's children on it. She's preparing to serve his body to part to his children. Um, one thing as well from this, which is a clear pattern, which has happened in the the. the Dennis Nilsson case uh, it's happened in this case if you see your partner going to buy a big pot you know one of the cooking pots I know the one you mean exactly yeah run because it's always a head that ends up in that pot it's, it's always like the, even the policeman apparently said they went in the house afterwards no guessing what's in that pot mm. if you see that bubbling away and they always leave it on there Castle why rock. is it always the day before they get found out that it's there I'm not saying she did it on purpose, but yeah, so, so she cut off his head, left it in there, and she served, she cut up, and apparently she cut up the parts of his buttocks to make, to sort of cook the cook the meat for the for the kids. She left those plates there for the children, and it's it's so eerie, because it looks, like just presented in a way, which yeah. just looks like, you know, a family, dinner. family meal, yeah. Yeah. So as well as this then, she also skinned, uh, fully skinned Price, and uh, hung his skin from a meat hook in the arch of their doorway. Yeah, it is. It's an escalation. It really is. And like <laughs> the blood spatter on the case, you could see yeah. very clearly he went from one room to the other, they're bleeding out. And then there's a bit where you can see where he lay on the floor and Hasper Catherine kind of performed all the acts. Um, yeah. And she cut up some of the meat and she, it, there's been speculated that she attempted to eat it, but she couldn't. And she threw it outside. But I've heard another claim that maybe she just did it to feed the dog. Some some of the meat from, yeah. from him, uh, yeah. I mean, there's some details here. Price's head was found in a pot of vegetables. The pot was still warm, estimated to be at forty to fifty Celsius. I don't know. I'm giving you tips how to cook a head, yeah. but indicating that the cooking had taken place in the early morning. Okay, I was just about to question why they got the temperature, but then to get put a kind of a forensic timeline on it. <laughs> yeah, that? yeah, fair it, play. So as Ben said, she would go on to skin him, which included the face, ears, scalp, and neck, like a macabre suit. Knight only left a small inch square of skin on the body, and this is this is horrible. The, the square had the scar from where she had stabbed him previously. So it's like she didn't want to ruin her handiwork beforehand. Yeah, or have a, a disfigured piece of skin in her meal. Yeah, a bit of gristle. Oh, yeah, that that is um, that's horrible. She had left a handwritten note on top of a photograph of Price, bloodstained and covered with small pieces of flesh. It read, so remember, she, Catherine couldn't read or write, but she wrote, Time got you back, Jonathan, for raping my daughter. You too, Beck, which was Price's daughter, for Ross, for little John. That was his son. Now play with little John's dick, John Price. Claims found to be baseless. So it kind of seems to be the ramblings there. It just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, so the next day, um, yeah. Price obviously didn't turn up to work. His neighbours saw the car in the driveway after he you know he'd been kind of very frantic about what was to happen to him. Um, his workmates were ran, kept ringing the house, kept ringing the house, kept ringing out. And that's when they kind of alerted police that maybe they need to go around there and check on him. So the police would arrive to the property, um, knock on the door, ring the doorbell, and there was no answer whatsoever. And you know they like the 
they knew Pricey, they knew that, you know, he would be there, um, and they were getting very concerned. So they broke down the door, went through the doorway, and they could immediately kind of sense something wasn't right. As you said, there were a few blood marks on the wall. Um, they went through into the living room area around to where the kitchen was, and on, on entry, they went past this curtain at the doorway, pushed past it, walked in for a little while longer. One of the policemen looked at his arm and thought he must have nicked his, ha- his arm on the door because he was covered in blood from when they broke in through the door. But they turned around to discover what they actually walked past wasn't the curtain. It was it was John Price's body, his skin hung up on the doorway on the on the meat hook. Um, they then would continue to kind of explore the house and see the kind of crime, seeing what happened. As I said, they saw the pot on the stove and said, "You can guess what's in there," because they'd already seen the body on the floor minus the head. Um, and they were very, you know, it, in this small kind of town, this kind of this kind of murder. I mean, anywhere this murder would be very, yeah. you know striking and different and you know it would be a horrible thing to find um they carried on walking around the property just trying to see if there's any you know see if the intruder was there see if there's any kind of evidence immediately that stuck out they went upstairs and they found knight's comatose on the bed um surrounded by pills um they're shaking her trying to get her awake and there's actually footage that emerges of of the of a ambulance coming to the property and taking knight out of the property um she the, like I said, she had recorded that video before, which kind of links into this. Maybe it was a suicide attempt after doing this, so kind of a final act with that that that, that note and those plates being left out for the daughters. But um, yeah, she, she wasn't successful in that attempt. So um, Detective Sergeant Wells, who was one of the first people on the scene, he has since retired from the police force, having lasted a decade in the job after the night murder. He actually had a nervous breakdown um, after this case, just just because of how gruesome it was and how hard it was to kind of like process in his head um he says today i still have psychological assistance almost on a monthly basis my diagnosis was severe chronic post-traumatic stress disorder it's never going to get any better but you just need to keep on top of it but one of the fingerprint guys he left the force that day straight away he said that day the scene was enough for him it just goes to show you know how powerful how graphic and horrible that scene was i mean it, it's one of those things it's like the Ed Gain case in terms of you know how unbelievable the crime is you kind of it's it's so alien to you to think about mm-hmm. that it just doesn't feel real but imagine actually being in that place the smells the kind of yeah. look the blood stain on the floor there's a horrible picture of where the body was laying beforehand which is you can see literally basically you know his outline of him perfectly it's absolutely horrible yeah and sparing a thought for people that are in forensics or emergency services because that is I mean I know it's, it's you, you sign up for it, so to speak, when you take on a role like that. But that that is a sight to behold. Yeah, and I mean, in one of the documentaries I watched, they had John's daughters on there, and one of them, they, they both spoke so eloquently about the whole thing. But um, the youngest daughter, Rebecca, um, she, how would you break the news your father was murdered? Number one, how would you break the news to your daughter that the fact that he'd been murdered, decapitated, and skinned? And she cooked. and she found out by reading it in a newspaper. Oh no! Which, again, it's just it's just horrible. And she said she couldn't like stop crying for days upon days and upon days. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's absolutely horrible. But yeah, by that stage, Catherine's been taken into hospital, and um, I mean, the police are waiting desperately, you know, to question her and find out what exactly had happened. I mean, they think they had a quite a good idea, but you know, they needed to hear what she had to say. So basically, she would spend a few more days in hospital before being uh, legally questioned. And uh, Knight's initial offer to plead guilty to manslaughter was rejected. So she's immediately kind of holding her hands up. She's not trying to uh, plead insanity or uh, deny it altogether or put any kind of, uh, you know, story together. And on the 2nd of March 2001, she was arraigned to uh, answer on the charge of murdering Price, to which she entered a plea of not guilty. So she's from go- she's gone quite quickly from holding her hands up and agreeing to manslaughter. But when, when it comes to being charged for murder, she states that it was wasn't um however the trial would be delayed due to illness of her counsel and was refixed for later in the year yep so it would be be quite a while in the gap here but it's november 9th 2001 Catherine mary knight was given the harshest sentence possible in australian law knight was the first woman ever in australia's history to be sentenced to life in prison without parole with her file marked never to be released um an interesting thing about this was a lot of the obviously with this kind of how gruesome this case was and how you know, sadistic it was they got psychologists to speak to her um, and they said that she had borderline personality disorder but she was um, she couldn't plead insanity and like it's been 
is very much strongly believed that you know she's she's ruled as a sound of mind but believed to be a psychopath you know she as i said like she's very charming she had no empathy it's all those kind of boxes she's up. sticking yeah i mean she, yeah. she could charm her way you know well she charmed herself charmed away from from man to man yeah. um very quickly as well you know forged new relationships but Psychologists confirmed it was likely that she had a dissociative period in which she committed the crime. So, like I said before, you know, when she was kind of developing, like living in that household, that's how, you know, it's quite a common way to kind of deal with the trauma of seeing, you know, your, your, your mum being raped on a daily yeah. basis. It, 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 Lock it out. Exactly, yeah. So it could be a fit of rage and this happened. But like we said, from all the kind of accounts from people about Price, his daughters, his friends, he was you know, he was described as a terrific guy, a hard worker. In terms of their arguments, it wouldn't have been. He can't see he had done anything, obviously, to warrant. I mean, who could do anything to warrant this? But yeah, it, it's it's horrible. He just wanted an easy life, didn't he? And it's 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 heartbreaking that he made the decision to go back to her, um, and ultimately that would lead to to this. Yeah, I mean, the the, the judge uh, Justice O'Keefe. Um, would say the last minutes of John Price's life must have been a time of abject terror for him as they were a time of utter enjoyment for her. She has not expressed any contrition or remorse and if released she poses a serious threat to security or of society. Um, one of the big things that kind of convicted her here and she couldn't kind of you know, weave a web of lies of how she was being, she was being um, abused by John herself um, was the fact that she spoke to her brother Charlie um, three weeks before she committed the crime and she gave, and she basically told him, "I'm going to kill John Price." And this was three wow. weeks before she did it. And he he actually came forward, which good on him. Came forward and spoke to the police, gave yeah. a statement, and said she told me she was going to do this. Um, I guess, like you know, before she she's gone to her twin sister Joy and said, "I've killed someone." So maybe he, that's why he didn't react on it and call the police because mm -hmm. she's she's kind of done this before. She said she's going to do something and she hasn't done it. Yeah. But um, yeah, well done <clears> to that man. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> Again, with Catherine, she seemed to be able to worm her way out of things. If he did actually go before and said she said that, she could very much deny it. But yes, she's been hit with the hardest sentence uh, ever in Australia's history. And there was also, to go back to obviously the impact that had on the uh, the police force that day and the investigators that day, the reason there was such a massive delay in um, the initial charges versus the actual conviction is that um, when the trial commenced, uh, they offered... 60 different jurors uh, the prospect of being involved in the case of the 60 only 5 accepted wow yeah here's a question um, for you Ben would you accept I, I don't know I kind of winced a little bit when you mentioned the detective walking past what he thought was a curtain mm. and that being the skin of Pricey um, I don't know but I'm then quite curious I'd want to I probably would accept yeah so yes Catherine now resides in the Silverwater Women's Correctional Centre in Western Sydney where she's known by the other inmates as the Nana. Price's daughters have said that she, they hate Knight and one day they would like to confront Knight and to ask her why she did it. Uh, I don't think they'd be getting any kind of answer that would actually... I mean, no, no answer is going to help you in that case. And, you know... Well, no. And from what we, what, we've, what we understand, she doesn't even have friends or family visit her now. Well, yeah, she, her twin sister did visit her, um, but apparently um, Knight is very content there. She, she's, she's known as the Queen Bee. Um, yeah. She does a lot of knitting um, and people you know, kind of go to her with questions and stuff like that. And she, she likes the kind of routine. She likes the structure. She, she, likes, she feels safe there. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a real. It's the, it's the place where she, you know, she she, she feels best. Um, Ironically, she's known as a bit of a peacemaker between yeah. the inmates as well. So they all call her Nana. She is described as a gentle soul and not a criminal to to any of us on the inside. She is a mediator. She's someone who sorted out problems before they get serious. Yeah, she, she would pull the girls in and try to get them to sort out whatever it was before it ended up with someone going into segregation. And someone who does visit her. Uh, quite regularly it's Mr Chillingworth wow and he's he's the one that she there didn't seem to be any kind of huge altercations between them she left him quite early it reveals he still visits his former partner in jail and provided a rare insight into the mind of Knight now 64 who he says has never been better um, but yeah she's very involved in prison She she's also the prison as the prison's event planner yep. she organises a big catch up every Friday she organises all the food and makes sure that everyone in the wing is part of it she includes every single person, even those she doesn't really like. She does it to bring everyone together. It's it's very bizarre that she seems to have found uh, 
found her place. Yeah, her calling. She's a prolific prison artist and she's become a skilled painter and raises money for the prison by selling her works. But she never signs anything. She does and never will. She doesn't want anyone making money of her name because she killed someone. So some morals there. Yeah, and despite her popularity within the prison, the prison officers never take their eyes off her and she is not allowed anywhere near knives um, within the kitchen. So maybe she just uses the blender a lot. I don't... I don't know. Or that thing that you smash and it chops into bits and you do it again and you get double chopped. And you do it again and you get triple chopped. They maybe. Maybe. You um, can't prove it. So this so this so this is a kind of a prisoner's officer's kind of um, thoughts on Catherine in the jail. She's the top boss of the jail. She takes no crap from anyone and absolutely gives it to the guards. If you come and search her cell, she'll stand in front of you with a smug face and scream at you. She'll demand to watch you search the cell and she will not leave the area. No, I'm fucking staying here, she'll scream. You have to use force to get rid of her. So so we just leave her there and let her watch. So, yeah, she's still, she's still you know, very much sticking to her kind of wanting to be in arguments herself, but it seems like she's kind of found her, found her place there. In terms of motive to this, very hard to pinpoint. It seems to be, like we said before, it's just kind of escalating over time. Um, and like we said, <laughs> the avatar and all that, that's where she felt, in control yeah it's not really it's it's, it's that learned behavior from her, uh, her parents as well um to be born into an environment where your mother and eventually yourself repeatedly sexually abused um but then the mother also kind of giving that insight and not being supportive of her um yeah it, it's, it's not what i mean she's over the years she's gone to see a psychiatrist in the, in the prison who and they've said she goes to see a psychiatrist regularly over the years she's done a lot of self-improvement work she's never really had any kind of authority against her so she's never been controlled when acting out um so running down the street with the axe um <laughs> stabbing with the scissors smacking with the frying pan setting clothes on fire she's essentially does the things that i like to do in gta I'm not doing the missions, but I'm causing chaos like that. Yeah, it is, it, it, there's been, as we said at the beginning of this, there's going to be a lot of red flags. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot of situations where people could have stepped in. Um, I don't think it's wise that she could check herself out of a, a hospital after taking a family hostage. Yeah. So there's a lot of moments yeah, there where you clearly think mm -hmm. if someone stepped in and could actually, this could have been prevented, definitely. Yeah, yeah and unfortunately no one did. She was allowed to get away with things again and again in terms of physically being violent, sexually potentially being violent, and, and certainly being manipulative and, and verbally aggressive. Um, yeah, she definitely had a, 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 a hard childhood, but yeah, leading to this, I mean, no one could predict it would go to this no. extent. It kind of goes to show, when once once this actually kind of started emerging in the news, Kellett's sister, Sandy, said to her partner, that's going to be Catherine Knight, that'll be Catherine Knight. And then she's like, no, you won't. And it was, and she she was not surprised that this mm -hmm. was Catherine Knight. It just goes to show that even though you could never predict someone going this way, it wasn't out of question for Catherine to be the one that was, if it, someone was going to do it, it was going to be Catherine that did it. Yeah. So let's do a little bit of trivia. So right, as of n most recent, um, most recent state in prison, uh, Catherine has been making headphones and she was recently pictured with her hand on the shoulder of Cardinal George Pell during a pastoral visit uh, to the Silverwater Woman's Prison. Um, she's also somewhat of a hoarder, apparently. Um, so um, the quote is that she's she's got a lot of shit everywhere, um, but apparently she hangs wool and uh, art all over, her, all over her walls and ceilings. That's so. better than rakes and weapons, though, machetes, isn't it? Definitely. Slightly nice. No More... knives above the bed. Yeah. I found uh, that there was a song called Catherine Knight by a band called Skinned, S-K-Y-N-D. And some of the lyrics are, I want to cut you in the dark, taste your bleeding heart. I hate you, hate you. I want to hang you from my door, bleed you to the core. I love you, I love you. And... The song is terrifying anyway, in terms of the music video. The oh, music really? video shows the, the final day and Catherine, like Catherine, someone playing Catherine Knight, oh. but the song itself is just a very bizarre song. So if you want to yeah. be slightly unnerved, go and listen to that. Yeah, there's also an image if you whack uh, Catherine Knight into the old Google machine. One of the first images that pops up isn't Catherine Knight. No, it's another prisoner who has red hair. Yeah, but it's it's a spooky image. You're just, you're just slagging off a woman. Then. No, no, no. It's I, I was like, oh, yeah, it's scary. Yeah, so you just basically... I think saying, it's from a horror film. It's just from... She's a prisoner in another prison. Why would they take it that in such a dramatic light? So look at likeies. A lot of to do at the end of the episode. I will be completely honest here. Um, 
I haven't really got one for Catherine Knight because I think she looks very uh, just like a yeah, normal person. But I'm gonna I'm gonna say a young Miss Finster. That's pretty good. John Price looks like R.C. Nesbitt. Um, and I think that's pretty, I'm pretty happy with that one. Shorty, um, Kellett, looks a bit like the singer from the monkeys. So there you go. And that is our look and likeies for the case. And that is the case of Catherine Knight, the abattoir murderer of Aberdeen. Yeah, a, a grisly one at that. Yeah, well, it was. And uh, it was just stood out as a very, I think it's quite known, well known in the true crime scene, this case, um, Catherine Knight. And there, there was a movie going to be made about her, but I think it was the people of the local area didn't want it to be made. And I, I was kind of Googling for it. I couldn't find it anywhere. So maybe they got their wish. So as always, thank you so much for... Uh, uh, checking us out we really appreciate it um and uh if you're looking for more content if you just can't get enough then we have got 20 plus 20 plus episodes over on our patreon uh, account which is patreon.com forward slash could murder a pod and we would really appreciate any support there only if you can yes only do it if you can and if you're sitting there going oh, i wish i had something to put a hot hot beverage in and i wish i had something i could, I could carry all this stuff in and if i wish i could my hat my head's a bit cold i wish i could wear a bloody hat why not go to our store where you could do all those things you can get a mug to put the hot liquid in so a bag to put the rest of the crap in and your hat can be on your head to warm it up and you look very swish in doing thank so thank you um but they could do it as well and if you've enjoyed the episode don't forget to subscribe and give us a like and hit the notification bell and please leave us a comment and let us know if you have any lookalikes or any cases that you want to hear from us or any questions let us know we like to always like to interact with you yeah and as always uh, to the people listening all of our social media handles at could murder a pod but come and say hello uh, leave a comment on youtube or drop us a message or, or comment on instagram facebook twitter we've got we've got a little bit of everything for you and if you listen to us on audio don't forget to leave us a little review we really appreciate that and don't forget to follow us on spotify because it does really help us out but until next time guys like we always say we do say it a lot keep doing what you're doing um unless that you're doing um skinning yeah. in knives above the bed frying pan dogs skin bye see ya <laughs> <laughs>